This is the real beginning. If I could have your attention, my name is Julie Kernan, and I'm a professor here of theater um, and speech communication. And I'm really deeply appreciative of you all coming to the stage reading of Waiting Together tonight, which was written by a student veteran, many of you may know. Uh, uh, Tom Laser, he is here, and after the reading, we will have a discussion. And so I really hope that you can stay for the reading. Many of you may or may not know that it's 10 minutes long, so I think you'll be able to keep your attention. The discussion after will be sort of dependent upon what you all feel like contributing and how much discussion we do have, but I sort of envision that being around 30 minutes or so. Um, and then there will be refreshments and you can chat some more and have some snacks and perhaps go home. That would be totally valid. But if you feel like sticking around for a little bit longer, there's going to be a writing workshop. Um, and we'll talk about that after as well. I did just want to make a note for anyone who hasn't been to a stage reading before that you'll notice that the actors have their scripts in their hand. The reason being that the purpose of a staged reading is to give feedback to the playwright. And so this is a first go at this one, right? I mean, we've had a number of rehearsals, but they are not supposed to have their lines memorized because we're working on the text. We want to make sure we get those lines exactly as they're written. And then after the discussion, we may adjust, the playwright may choose to adjust those, etc. So without further ado, I will um, in, let you have Waiting Together. How long did they say for the wait? 30 minutes? It's been almost an hour. This is my fifth visit this month and not one of them is on time. Lots of bets, man. Not enough time. It's just getting to me. They give me a day's notice for these appointments. I show up on time. They're late. Cody. Not just that, the traffic to get here. They schedule these things right during rush hour. Man. I, I can't go anywhere place. else. At least you're getting help. Yeah, but like even the parking. We drive down here, never find a spot. We've gotten like what? Three tickets in five visits? Hey. Because these damn appointments man, always go to work. Cool it, okay? Only reason I come with you on these is so you'll keep a level head, all right? Yeah. All right? Sorry. No worries, brother. It's one. At least we're here together. Yeah. Like always. Yeah, I've been holding your hand ever since kindergarten. That kid pushed me down the hill. Jesus, we've been together a long time. Yep. All through school. Even enlisted together. I don't know how you could have done it alone. I could handle myself. Oh. You couldn't even handle the drill sergeant in basic. What? Drill sergeants? What? Day one? The rules of defect? Sergeant Smith, remember? I remember Smith. Yeah, yeah you don't remember. You don't remember, day one, the rules of defect. Oh, that shit, come on. Three rules of defect. One, shut up. Two, eat up. Three, get up. You're supposed to respond any time they ask you a question. I almost lost it. And then when Smith yelled, what's the first rule of defect? It was day one, day one man. You're the only one to say, shut up, drill sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> it was basic. I know, but we all got better. I could have done it alone. Yeah, how many times you almost get your ass shot off downrange? Hey, I did better than a lot of those other guys. Yeah? Yeah, like Greg's. Remember him? Yeah. Poor bastard. He even saw the pressure plate. Did better than him. You just didn't stop that time. I made out all right. Okay? Okay. You made out all right. Yeah, I did. I could hack it. At least physically. Huh? You're just a little wackadoodle upstairs now. <laughs> Aren't we all? Uh, speak for yourself. <laughs> How is that, man? We did the same shit. I guess I got my own way of dealing with that. Same basic, same training, same unit, same deployment. Yeah. How come you're not waiting to get your number? Well, you were always the more sensitive type. Me? I stay quiet. You didn't always. I didn't always have shit to deal with. Yeah, not until that Humvee flipped and we lost Marcos and Johnson and LT. Yeah. Man, I talked to the chaplain so much about that. Yeah. And what I do, huh? Kept my mouth shut and continued mission. You did get quiet after that crash. How's it going, Trooper? 
Another long wait. What time was your appointment? Nine. You haven't seen yet? No, sir. Typical. I've been here, coming here 30 years. It's always the same. At least here. A buddy of mine was in the service with me. Goes to Milwaukee VA. Never has any of this problem. Oh, I know. Yeah, we just got out a couple months ago, and I, I got all these appointments here, so we drive an hour each way every few days for just a half-hour appointment. And there's no parking. Not one damn spot. Why do they always schedule these appointments during rush hour? They know we're going to have a hell of a time getting here. What's right for you? Army. <laughs> we thought we'd be different. Everyone in this town goes Navy or Marine, so we went Army. I couldn't have handled being on a boat, I know that much. Him? Yeah, maybe. But not me. Anyway, Army worked out for us, mostly. <laughs> huh, you just got out? Yeah, a few months ago. I was uh, medically discharged. This one here finished his contract. I was so scared, I asked you to Cody, join, and then, Cody, and then what? Cody, Cody, 
Calm, calm down. down. No! Calm down, son. Nurse! I killed you. I fucking killed you! I couldn't hack it. Burnt from all the convoys, and, and you wouldn't ask LT if, if you could take my place. You, you wanted to give me a break. You just wanted to give me a break. I, I couldn't even handle it. You still were looking out for me, just like fucking kindergarten. I killed you. I fucking killed you. Now what? What do I do? Sit in traffic and get parking tickets and wait in this goddamn room for the rest of my life. At least you're alive, Cody. portraying this survivor's guilt while, I don't know if you have that of your own, a ton of veterans do. Yeah. Like it's something like I have, I'm assuming most of the veterans have some sort of experience like that. So how, is it, how did you put yourself into that place to feel that pain? The confusion. It's a great question. Oh, I think, um, I think as an actor, you know, we, we access kind of what's available to us. So. I don't know if I have anything that's exactly like that, yeah. um, but um, I certainly know about loss and grief and guilt. Um, and I think through the repetition, um, listening and kind of being in the moment, you, uh, you begin to simulate something.
thing that uh, starts to take on a life of its own and becomes kind of real, start, starts uh, invoking real feelings. Thank you. Yeah. It, it just it felt real, so that's where I was curious because I mean, Tom's a skilled writer as well, yeah. but it just felt like things that go on in our inner monologue sometimes. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because it, it's hard to do if the writing isn't there, and when the writing is, is as good as Tom's, it's, you know, you just hop on the train and let it take it. Thank you all. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Well, was there any hint in the earlier dialogue that uh, John was up there? Uh, I didn't see any. I was wondering if I missed it. Uh, so there's some, I don't know when you keyed into him not being there, but um, when the old man comes in yeah. and he, um, so Cody's character starts talking, uh, he said he's using I, so he's like, I come here and I, you know, and I drive all this way, and then he starts saying we, and the first couple of times he says we, it's sort of like, well, you could be like you and your spouse who's someplace else right now, and then he actually references someone sitting over there, which the audience, of course, sees someone sitting over there, so doesn't think about it necessarily. But that's why the old man leaves, because he's uncomfortable. He's like, okay, this is a little bit awkward. I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, and then, you know, so, but you don't necessarily <coughs> catch that. Does that explain? Was that answering your question? Okay. Uh, Julie, and then we'll go back there. So my, I work with, um, with these veterans, and I also work with the homeless, and I've also worked with homeless veterans. And the thing that I've taken out of all of this work is this sort of preoccupation with shame. And I noticed that when you were talking, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Mine, Gabriel? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you were talking about what you did to sort of conjure this feeling that was so believable, you said guilt. Yeah. And this is a big part of this shame discussion. Is it guilt or is it shame? So I'd like to ask you, did you mean to say guilt? Or mm. if you rethought, if you sort of rethought it a minute, would you actually change that to shame? Oh, that's good, yeah. And then I would also like to know from Tom what his intention was, guilt or shame. Yeah, there's definitely some shame there. I would add shame uh, to it, yeah. Um, I think the, the shame of, uh, of being uh, perceiving uh, himself as weak and always needing help and um, not being good enough, not being strong enough. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's definitely a color in the palette for sure. Yeah, I think, I think the core of it is guilt. I think guilt is something that's very internal and individualized. And shame always has to be sort of me in relation to something else that you feel the shame. And I think that the shame that comes out um, is Cody seeing all of that reflected through John, his memories of John, and just John's sort of his projection, you know, at times comforting him, at times, you know, antagonizing him. Um, and I think that that shame is sort of uh, what Cody is aware of in the world in his relation to things that he sort of gives himself through John. So there is, there is both. Yeah, so, so if we think of shame as something that you aren't feeling bad about, but that you have become it, right? So you didn't just do a bad thing, but you are a bad person. That's where it crosses over into shame. Yeah, that's a great yeah, no. Yes. Uh, Julie, I'd like to ask you, um, when you got the, the script from, from Tom, mm -hmm. with just words on a piece of paper, did, did he have any stage direction or voice rises or he kneels or, and was that your part of it? And how did you collaborate with him on that part? Of it? Um, so he did write, as most playwrights do, some stage directions, right? So there's some stage directions. So the drops to his knees at the end is a stage direction. Um, he didn't do anything with voice rising or intonations or things along those lines. Um, I think, you know, my process as a director was to break the script down into different units and sort of try to understand, this is what I love about playwriting, right, is it's dialogue, so it's people's inner thoughts and external thoughts, and so you go kind of beyond Tom writing them to me thinking, why is this person saying this, and when, and at what point is a transition, and what trigger word kind of makes that transition happen. And so we, you know, I went through and identified all of those different sections and then kind of played off the actors to 
and they played with how to, how to have all those colors come out, right? A lot of the block, blocking itself um, became sort of natural as we were running through it a few times. So, so the sort of circle around and the exiting up the aisle and the returning is not necessarily in the script. Um, it's not prescribed in the script. They did. The two main actors did a great job. They really did. <laughs> Um, so I have two questions, but the first one is why, um, what, what are you looking to do with this? Right? Did you want to have to read just to get feedback in here, or are you looking to build off of it and add more to script, make it into something more than a short, or what was what is your intent with this here now? With this, um, twofold. So so there's there's two major options in my mind, is um, is keeping it as a 10 minute contained given moment, um, and see, see how people felt, does it work as a moment, does it work as a self? Um, if I were to expand it, which is an option, I think I might follow a totally different path than, than this. I do still like the idea of the setting of a VA waiting room. There's a lot that can happen in there, but it probably wouldn't be these two characters. Um, but the main thing, either way, that I was looking for was the general reaction from people, what, what, they, what they liked about it, what they didn't like, uh, if this theme even resonated with people. <coughs> that was part of my second question was, were, I, I think it's kind of come out, but, I, but the two themes that I heard were about like the problems with the VA, and then the second one that eventually we got to was that survivor's guilt. Um, so was there one that you wanted to hit on more than the other, or um, did one come out of the other? Everything I write is uh, survivor's guilt. Everything I, it's, I think it was Tim O'Brien said, I'll always, I'll always be writing about veterans some way, and I can totally, totally that it's, it will always be in my, any type of story I write. Um, I think the VA lends itself as a good setting to discuss those things. Um, but primarily, it all centers on the guilt. Yes. Um, I have a question about the two-part question for you, Tom. Um, first, do you view John as an antagonist? So John's an interesting character because uh, he is at times. Um, and you probably saw how, how they played it, where at times he was a comforting factor and at times he was antagonizing. And I think what, what John really comes to represent is, I mean, he's, a, he's not real. He's an aspect of Cody. And what he's that part of Cody that, that is both tethering him to the past and also telling him to move on. It's a very weird, like, when you deal with trauma and you're stuck in the past but always telling yourself to move forward, it's a very weird back and forth where this character can actually be bold because you have to kind of be comfortable with the past to move beyond it and the past itself is kind of antagonizing you. So um, he kind of is bold. He's that ambiguous facing, facing a difficult situation to get out of it. Sure, uh, thank you for that. Um, in response to that, uh, then I'd say, if, if the conflict is between those two characters, then um, I see the, the ending as a great opportunity, and I wonder if you, if you would do this, um, for a confrontation on stage between them, because what happened, I guess, uh, now was that um, Cody was brought off stage by the nurses, and then John gave, uh, well, at least you were alive, to, more to the audience or to the room, but uh, would you consider that confrontation to happen between them at that moment in the same space? It, it really could. Actually, that's a really interesting take on it. If I were, instead of ending it in this, in this sort of separating way, um, it would be a very long fight. I think it would be a big back and forth um, that um, Actually, I think that that's actually a great idea. If I were to restructure this whole thing, that would just be the core of it, probably. I guess I mean confrontation. The in, confrontation. In the, in the words of not like uh, battle or conflict, but just direct, it would be to him, you know what I mean? So that the oh, characters can come to a realization in the final moment between each other. Yeah, I certainly like it. It's a, it's a good option. I think. I'm just interested in uh, the resolution between the two characters and um, what comes out of their relationship once uh, 
once John reveals to Cody that he is dead. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I think, um, just well, curious. Would you guys want to comment on it? Because I know we work with yeah. that a bit. I, I have something to say, but I think no, you no, guys, no. you guys start. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think, I think that's one of the most interesting colors to play with here is that, you know, John being both a menace and a comfort, um, uh, both of those things being present, um, I, I think is, is where the exciting bits of this character are. Um, in terms of uh, directly to him, you know, I never read it as him discovering or coming to terms with it. I sort of always had that, you know, he's, he's got the John's dead there the whole time, and this is the, what he does to cope with it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I think the, it creates the possibility for Cody that if, um, if he lets go of uh, this ghost, who's such a huge part of his identity, uh, what is he left with, who does he become? And I think the lines, you know, what am I? What do I do with the rest of my life? Where do I go? Who am I? So I think, to a large extent, his his identity is is tethered to this uh, the memory and the trauma and this ghost. Um, so this divergence that happens at the end um, kind of lends itself to uh, to that to asking that question: where, you know, where does Cody go from here without the ghost? Which I kind of that's an interesting thing to. Oh well, yeah, because your whole the whole life. You have me right there with him. Yeah. yeah. I actually would like to ask Tom briefly, sorry, because I'm like so in the middle, I'm so interested in this conversation, but just briefly, do you feel like at the end of this play, it's the end of the ghost for him, or what, is it just the end of one cycle of the ghost? I would say one cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It feels so, like it's the so I didn't, yeah. yeah, I didn't want to speak to that unless it was kind of yeah. what you were looking for. The way we staged it, the way we sort of played with it, is that maybe not in this way of a VA hospital every week this happens, right? This is probably a unique thing for this thing to happen. But that he is aware and not aware of the ghost, as you said, throughout his day as he goes along. It's there next to him sometimes, maybe pleadingly not, but often there. And, but there are times when the character is real next to him and times when he realizes it's, a, it's not a ghost, and when it is a ghost. And that's a very difficult thing to grapple with. And so that's sort of what we're seeing as the pinnacle of the scene is him realizing. And it starts a bit earlier after they talk about, you know, um, I was supposed to be on that one. Yep. So the character, Cody's character actually references the explosion, the experience of the explosion a number of times before that in the script, and as and he is not remembering that he was there, right? So then with this time he has this like, oh wait, then he remembers and has that kind of all up. But I won't talk to you too long about that. There was another question. Where, where was oh. we Okay, let's do, oh, there's where it was first, sorry. I knew there was another Michael one. Michael Wilson. Yeah. Yes, so, um, so I, I did personally like, just because of kind of where this, the whole play seems to be going, um, was that at the end, when the character walks off, and then kind of like the ghostly figure stands there, it keeps that mentality that this spirit lives in veterans for life, that doesn't go away. And I feel like if you were gonna, to write something different to make it that this, character was finally coming to grasp with like this is just in my head like this is just an emotion that <laughs> follows me like a cloud every day then that would be a whole different presentation I feel like that would be a whole different script but I think it was perfect how you wrote it that way I think the the actors were terrific um, and I, I think it really resonated with us back here for sure um, cause that it went from like oh this is, this is funny and it's like, damn, I'm about to cry, bro. So it's very, very well done. Very well done. Um, let's go. I think Drew had something. And well, I guess I have a comment and a question. Uh, now that I read the credits, I, I think you need to change the label of the character of old man to mature man. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> your father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I my, didn't label the character, but I did convince my father to help us out. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
My, my question is for Tom about um, how much you thought about uh, the particularity versus the universal nature of your own experience and how you wove that into this play. You're an OEF veteran who saw certain things that had a certain set of experiences. You're writing about those experiences. How much of uh, writing this play did you consciously engage in the act of thinking about whether or not this spoke to other veterans' experiences, and how much of it was just solely your own? Um, yeah, I think, I think I've gravitated more towards fiction um, lately and with this play. Um, simply to understand my own experiences more. It's sort of a weird trick in writing that if you fictionalize everything and write about anything but the truth, you end up with the truth, um, which is really what I have been doing. So, um, so for this one in particular, I, I was really trying to come to terms with uh, certain experiences I had. Uh, the character of Cody is actually based on a very real human being. Um, he was alive and well today, thankfully and sort of my thoughts about him, and a moment where I saw him snap in a VA waiting room. Um, and then I took that initial feeling, that very personal um, experience, and I fictionalized as much as I could about it. But even my fictionalization were based on people that I had served with that maybe had been in Iraq, had similar experiences, and I did that in a way to distance myself from my own experience, that I was fictionalizing, but also trying to understand sort of their experiences, where they were coming from. Um, and I felt that by doing that, I was getting to maybe a universal picture, that I was distancing myself, I was incorporating other people that I knew pieces of their experience. Um, and I think, I think there is always a, a very, very vital human route to anything um, veteran-oriented. Um, that uh, whether consciously or not you write it in a universal way, it seems that, that people generally understand um, the core concept of it. Okay, um, let's go to the back and then to the front. I, have to hand up first. I appreciated the use of someone taking your duty and then something happening to them, because that happens a lot. And I don't know how many people realize how much that affects somebody when someone takes your duty and then something happens. So I really appreciated using that because it's a very good example of survivor's guilt and what happens to people. Yeah, I, uh, as a uh, Vietnam era veteran, I saw it as a universal kind of statement on PTS. Uh, I got that feeling of the ghost out there that's tormenting somebody to the angst, <laughs> the reacting angst and so on, and uh, it's not going to go away, and it was well done. Thank you. Yes, here in the front, and we'll work our back. So I was really, thought that was really impressed up by the act of the writing. Um, there's a lot of, you know, change for 10 minutes short, and I'm not a playwright in any way, but I um, recently this experience has become more personal for me, um, and so I, having a just felt like the, the lack of resolution at the end was what made it so powerful, especially with a 10 minute play. You know, this is, it's just, you make such a point in such a short period of time with such power and such simplicity. It was extremely well done. I think a, a longer play would, you know, you could build so much from that. It would be a very different animal, very powerful in and of itself to explore some of the depth and the richness of what that experience is like. But even then, I think it was almost doing a service to think that you could neatly tie it up in a bow and say, off you go, it's all better now. And like any of these veterans here can attest to, what we hear all, every day is that there's a double pack, impact of that that is so safe with you forever. You don't go through something like that and you need change. So I thank you. That was such a good, it was unexpected for me to be here, but you were the friend, and I, I, I'm so glad I made it through. <laughs> Um, I just want to know, Tom, what you're what you're doing next, and where where people might read more of your writing. 
really was fantastic. So many of us are proud of you. Um, the, the next uh, June 21st, uh, Cambridge, I believe it's called the Friends House. Um, it's uh, Midnight Voices. I'll be sharing stage with Mark Levy. And uh, me too. And you, great, everybody's here. So come see us on uh, June 21st. Um, check with one of them, because they'll know the specific location better than I do. Um, that will be sort of the next public reading that I'm doing. Um, I'm currently working uh, on a novel length, uh, fictionalized version of my deployment um, that I'm hoping will kind of give uh, me a little clarity as to the circumstances of it and uh, honor those that I served with, sort of in a funny way. They, I told some of them about it and they all think it's hilarious. So um, that's, that's maybe a few years off, but that's sort of the next big thing. That and you write about. poems too, right? I do write a lot of poetry, yeah. <laughs> Yes, he's a wonderful published um, author and now playwright and spectacular. I would also say, and I know we have a, a couple other questions, that something that Tom has done that I think is in the program is through this academic year run writing workshops for veterans and community members, both on and off campus, alternating months off campus and on campus. Um, and those have been very successful as a way to process, right? Uh, Tom and I, when I first met him last spring in the veterans learning community, talked a lot about using creativity and to process and as a way for veterans to have like an outlet. And I feel like we are doing that later today as well, but I feel like those things and having, if, if people were to say, where would this 10 minutes go? I feel like using it to create dialogue would be a great thing. It's short and it's sweet, and it could be mounted in any VA or veterans area or place, or you know, kind of like this, but really kind of quickly and easily to then start a dialogue about these sorts of issues, which I know you guys do a lot of those sorts of things as well. So, um, a couple of last questions here. Yes. A quick, just uh, as a couple other people went. I guess I missed all the foreshadowing coming until somebody made it explicit toward the end about you death. And, and now I want to see it again. Is it going to be staged again, or is this video going up anywhere? Or? Well, the video is part, do you want to speak about what the video is part of? Uh, yeah, sure. This is uh, Webcam Studios is, uh, is filming it. Um, I'm not sure where it will go from here, but that gentleman in the back, his name is Walt. Uh, <laughs> the, um, well, I'm here at the request of Tom. We've done a few other things with the veterans, with Mark Levy. Uh, we did, uh, they did a reading at, with the workshop here on the campus about six weeks ago. We covered that. And then uh, Mark and Tom were part of a um, uh, panel at the community house in Hamilton. We take that. And I've also had a couple of one-on-one -on -one shows uh, with Mark and, and, and with, uh, with Tom. Well, it's a longabout way of saying we're, we're taping this, we're going to show it on our channel, but as far as the content, I'm going to make it available, can make it available uh, to you, Julie. Of course, Tommy, you can cut it and paste it, do whatever you want with it, use it on YouTube or you use it on Facebook pages, whatever you want. We will also, uh, what local access television does is we share content with each other. So I'll, I'll send this over to Salem. To, uh, to Danvers, to Peabody, et cetera, K-Ban TV. So if you have any questions about that, just just contact them. Um, you can go through Tom and just contact me at, at Bedcamp. You know, you know. But even YouTube, I just like see, how did I miss all that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta see it again, right? Yeah. right? And a very quick one, <laughs> that flag being backward, is that who's? Oh. So that, uh, that's stress? A, that's a, well, uh, flags upside down, you're in distress. That is an yeah. IR flag that you wear while you're deployed, or as they say, downrange. Uh, that's actually my deployment um, patch that I wore for the majority of the deployment, so I gave them that. Uh, we kind of discussed a little bit in terms of sort of costume, you know, what uh, sort of my generation's veterans do. We don't typically wear the like you know, World War II vet kind of hats. We'll wear like a, a tactical patch hat. <laughs> we always have dip. <laughs> yeah, we keep them, uh, the, the, what they call the E4 starter kit. He's got a monster under his seat. He's got a dip. His tags. Uh, it's sort of these little things. You know, a lot of guys will have like that pack. You know, there's like um, subtle cues. You know, people would see that and kind of be like, oh, that's a deployment flag. You know, 
So who will cue that? Then? Yes. His character. Oh, okay. I didn't realize, realize it had time. Okay. It's backwards because you're charging into battle, so it's like it's fluttering behind. So you. they. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's on your it's on your patch. It's supposed to be. Well, I know if you've good. got match yeah. set, one of them would be, but I don't know on the front here. Yeah, that's how it would be on it. On uh, on it would always be on the right, and it's supposed to look as if as if you were holding a flag forward. Okay, and one really stupid civilian question: What is BFAC? The whole the dining <laughs> facility and cafeteria is a place where you eat, uh, and it is very when you're in basic training, it is very. Um, Organized and rigid, and everything you do, you hold your, your two cups of water like this because that's how you hold the grenade. You sit in a particular way, you eat in a particular way, um, and it's a main way that drill sergeants like to just mess with people because you're usually you have guard down, you're eating as fast as you can. And, uh, Sorry, I got that from context, but I'm trying to work out my head what it's yeah. Like, exactly. so there's a lot of jokes come out of the defense. Thank you, Roger. I just want to say to you that so much of this conversation was played out in body language, and I know that that was your direction, and it was excellent. I mean, it was a whole different layer of the conversation, and it might have, you know, I mean, it's embedded in what Tim, uh, what Tim? good grief, <laughs> Tom <laughs> wrote, he was only my student for a whole semester, right? So, but it was embedded in what Tom wrote, but you saw it, and I just think that was excellent. So kudos to you. Um, Thank you. I, I feel like the script itself was so so wonderful for me. I the first time I read it, I was like, wow, right? And then we decided to do it, and I was able to noodle into the language and see why is he saying this and that and the words. And as I said before, it's what makes me really excited to sort of try to play it out. And, um, we have two spectacular um, actors as our main actors. Yeah. 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 Woo!